Matthias. Bill, thanks a lot. Welcome. And very excited to be here and really congratulations for, you know, fantastic uh, turnout and we are, we are very excited to see Transmart really gaining such a extensive reach out into the community. And what I hope to do over the next 45 minutes or so to give you the rationale why tools like Transmart are absolutely critical for the success of our activities in uh, clinical translational medicine and uh, experiences from our side over the last 18 years with various approaches to reach out to our community and uh, to serve our research domain effectively. So the challenge and I think the promise of uh, translational medicine is that up to recently and in renal disease actually up to a few years, months ago, we are using descriptive disease categorization uh, in the way we classify patients, we diagnose patients, we provide predictions of disease course to our patients and uh, the treatment. But that's a problem because if you have a descriptive disease categorization, you have multiple pathogenetic mechanisms under the same heading. So we have the mixed bag problem that uh, we have many different activities going on at the same time, which as clinicians we cannot discern and thereby our uh, disease prognostication is chronically poor and our treatment interventions equally. And at least in nephrology, for many of our diseases, it's the art of trial and error, meaning we know that several available aggressive treatments may be effective and we try them out and see to which of the patients responds to. But this is shifting as we speak right now as we have now with molecular medicine the opportunity to define the active mechanisms in an individual patient at a given time and then base our prognostication on these specific mechanisms and obviously target as a therapy to interfere with the mechanisms currently destroying organ function. And this is a concept which was picked up by the Medical Research Council using actually Brian and Gill schema here in the center a few years back along the precision medicine concepts, where the statement is that we can learn from observational studies during normal course of clinical care if we establish a knowledge network with an informational comments where multi-layer data sets are available. That might sound familiar to this community here, with the expectation that if we define diseases at these depths that we can come up with a new taxonomy, a new disease classification based on mechanistic insight for accurate diagnosis, targeted treatment, and overall improved health outcomes. Sounds like a lofty goal, and if one starts to look into these details, it is actually a tremendous challenge because if we get serious about defining disease processes in comprehensive terms towards a holistic disease definition, then our standard approaches where we have investigators gaining deep expertise in each of these domains alone doesn't suffice because uh, we have to integrate this information to define the key drivers of the disease. And if one cuts across these multitudes of discipline, one is quickly exposed to the challenge depicted in this early picture of the University of Michigan, where you can see that we scientists live in these little cubicles and we know close to everything from close to nothing. At least that's a conventional way we were selected for for the last couple of uh, hundred years. Uh, but for the concepts I just alluded to, a critical aspect is that we not only know who is living next door, but we also can communicate our insights about the disease processes. And if this is happening, then indeed significant insight and progress can be made. And one aspect which uh, draw me early on to the field of bioinformatic integrative biology or systems biology or as Jürgen Schnermann, my mentor here in physiology, would refer to as good old-fashioned physiology is that that's the essence, that we in many instances are communicators between different knowledge domains. And I would like to give you an overview how over the last 15 years we have tried that in different areas of our field with different questions, the challenges we encountered, the solution we attempted, and develop from there rationale why we feel Transmart is truly a disruptive event for our community. So if we want indeed to harness the capabilities of these genome-wide analysis for an integrated view 
of mechanisms in our field, in specifically in the glomerular filter failures in, in the kidney. And obviously the first step is that we have to have uh, the cohorts in place who are a priori designed for both clinical and molecular phenotyping. And here we have an advantage uh, as nephrologists as we do take regularly uh, fine needle biopsy cores from our patients as they present with the disease at EDC's initiation and thereby have a window to attack the disease process in flagranti in the tissue, which in many other instances, like other end organ damages in diabetes, lupus, hypertension, microvascular disease might not be feasible. And we have a second advantage that in the kidneys, we do get a liquid biopsy, meaning the urine contains the essential proteins, even essential cells from the deceased organ uh, in a way that with some degree of technology, they can be recovered and made available. And this adds a time dynamic to this single snapshot of a renal biopsy, which Lucy is performed only once in the patients, so that we can develop time sequences. And if we design our study really clever, then we can link actually the urine sample at time of biopsy with the intrarenal event, and then use that as a surrogate for uh, prognostication and treatment response assessments. Yes, obviously it defined clinical phenotyping and a sophisticated uh, approach to define the structural alteration seen in these biopsies is the goal then uh, to link molecular and clinical phenotyping uh, together. And uh, one advantage in the field is that over the last 15 years, we actually saw several efforts emerging from the initial efforts in uh, Europe with an EU framework five funding activity that in North America in Southeast Asia, in uh, Beijing and Nanjing, in uh, Africa and Australia and New Zealand, we have activities deploying uh, standardized protocols and sample procurements from the bottom up so that these independent research endeavors actually uh, are at a stage that if we have a shared data analysis platform in place, that these data sets can actually combine in meaningful meta-analysis across these different activities. And I have listed here kind of the main six ongoing projects right now, uh, a project where we have deployed Transmart against uh, four weeks ago is a rare disease clinical research network funded by NCATS and a patient interest group, the Nefcure Foundations, where we have 22 centers across North America. We've enrolled over 600 patients who are prospectively followed, a thousand data points captured at each uh, clinic visits, uh, deep information along the entire genotype, phenotype continuum, digital histopathology, very rich data source in a modest sized population, but for a rare disease cause, uh, quite a robust starting point. We have an EU framework five and seven funded activity where we have over 2,500 uh, uh, samples captured, quality controlled, and available for molecular studies across Europe. We have a North American sister network for that. We work very closely with an intramural program from the Diabetes Institute at NIH, who has followed a Native American cohort in Arizona, the Pima Indians now for three decades, where we have uh, clinical uh, information and samples over a couple of decades available from our individuals. We are part of a European rare disease consortium focused on omics scale technology against rare renal diseases and are thereby able to link these efforts back into our rare disease efforts. And very uh, excitingly, Akinolo Ocho here from Michigan, together with Dr. Adu from Ghana, uh, received funding from the H3 Africa NIH and Wellcome Trust to build a sister network uh, to these networks up here with similar standardized protocols across Africa and has uh, enrolled over the first 12 months, over 2,000 patients already, again, following the same procurement protocols and data acquisition. So we are at a stage now that these tools, samples, and soon data sets are becoming available. And the question is, how can we utilize them for towards the goal of the translational medicine concepts illuminated earlier? The first step is to generate a molecular map, meaning to cut out the landscape of kidney diseases as we see it across uh, the disease populations. And here uh, we are fortunate to have an uh, NIH O'Brien Renal Center in Michigan, a P30 mechanisms, which allows us to build not only cohorts, but also bioinformatic uh, analytical capabilities and systems biology concepts 
against these data sets so that we can procure them in a manner uh, to be interrogatable uh, with the research community. And with these elements in place, we are now in a position to ask the question which I have uh, uh, defined earlier, what are the disease mechanisms in each of these large scale data sets? And again, following the principle that yes, it is quite informative to relate transcriptomic signatures between different diseases to define which uh, transcriptional signatures are associated with a certain disease type, but it gets uh, so much more powerful if we can address with the adequate ontology how these mechanisms are cutting across these various knowledge domains. And for that, I would like to give you three case studies where over the last uh, six years we were able to gain traction with some of these uh, elements, but also to define some of the limitations we have been exposed to up to now, uh, which I think are challenges which are out uh, to this and our community as well. I will give you an overview how integration of transcriptomic networks across species leads to cross-cutting uh, mechanisms who are bona fide therapeutic targets, currently evaluated in interventional trials. I will give you an approach how genotype, phenotype integration might help to define the molecular concepts of some of the genetic risk variants we see in our common diseases. And finally, how defining cell type specific uh, mechanisms using large scale data and public knowledge integration can identify uh, novel disease drivers, both for rare diseases and common diseases in a tissue specific manner. So with the first study, integration of transcriptomes above therapeutic targets, we are integrating phenome, proteome, and transcriptomic data sets. So from these elements, we are pulling in from all three main research area data sets and expertise to come uh, to a comprehend, more comprehensive disease definition. The approach here actually was deployed not only against diabetic kidney disease, but with Eva Feldman from neurology also against diabetic nerve disease, where we evaluated a set of mouse models who develop various elements of the diseases uh, over uh, six to nine months versus the human data sets we have available using standardized data processing elements to then compare where the expression signatures are converging and where the diverging with follow-up validation steps down below. Initially, we performed a gene-by-gene -gene analysis but uh, very quickly it became apparent that yes, mice are somewhat different from humans. And uh, trying to do a naive one-on-one -on -one mapping really did not reveal the uh, underlying biological concepts. So uh, together with Dr. Patel here at that time at Michigan, we deployed uh, an indexing technique where we actually define our networks by the structure of the network node in a local graph element and then build a hybrid index structure for efficient searches of matching day, uh, neighborhoods so that a similarity in the neighborhood is sufficient to actually tag a network to be replicated across the species. And uh, with this element, we could actually confer short core network elements across the human and the mouse models. We have done that with the three dominant mouse models in the community capturing type one and type two, and actually even type two with a hypertensive disease state generated from the glomerular compartments, the microvascular filter units in the kidney, uh, microdissected out of the humans and the animal models, the corresponding gene expression networks, and then overlay them and ask the question, what are the key conserved nodes between the human and the mouse in each of these three networks? And then one can do further analysis here, for example, displaying the canonical pathways, how they are enriched, which each of these three model systems, when they are mapped back to the human, you can see that there are a certain set of pathways who are robustly conserved between human and mice, irrespective of the model system interrogated. We have pathways who are reserved in two, but not in all three. And then we have unique pathways seen in one model systems or the others. So uh, with this approach, we actually identified one uh, chemokine signaling pathway, the jack stud pathway, to be a significantly associated pathway in diabetic kidney disease, which uh, primarily endocrine disorder, uh, at least at that stage, was uh, not a well-known fact. Uh, but 
we could look back to studies done by Dr. Petit and our group a few years earlier, where we looked at early diabetic nephropathy in humans, both in the kidney filter, the glomerulus, and in the tubal interstitial compartments, and could show that actually that pathway was significantly activated in a compartment and stage specific manner across that disease as it progressed over time. And these expression data on transcript level could be validated by our colleagues in Europe in the European biopsy cohort on protein level as depicted here with control, lupus, and hypertensive nephropathy showing only minimal induction of JAK2, whereas diabetic nephropathy both in inflammatory cells but also in intrinsic renal cells had a robust induction of JAK2. So it has resulted in significant follow-up experimental work by Dr. Prosius here in our department generating cell line specific overexpression uh, model system in the mouse interrogating the specific effects of JAK stat activation in virus tissue compartments. But at the same time, uh, we were discussing with Eli Lilly opportunities for repurposing compounds into humans based on experimental data sets. And as Eli Lilly had baticitinib, an oral JAK2 inhibitor in phase two for rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis with a very good safety profile, they were quite content to repurpose that compound into diabetic nephropathy starting the study in August 2012. And actually, we expect to hear the outcome of that study in the next month or two. And uh, the interesting part was that from the first discussions we had around JAK2 inhibitor and diabetic nephropathy up to enrollment of the first patient in the phase two trial, this was achievable in 14 months, significantly cutting down the usually otherwise quite extensive developmental time point with this repurposing strategy. One challenge in defining these trials, uh, particularly in diabetic kidney disease, is who is at risk of developing endpoints. And this is a second effort led by our group uh, over the last nine years that we are uh, very carefully mapping a large-scale molecular data set on outcomes like loss of renal function or uh, leakiness of the filtration barrier determined by proteinuria uh, to select predictors from large-scale genomic data set. And again, taking advantage of the fact that we have expression data from the disease tissue available in contrast to uh, the proteomics efforts in the field, uh, starting from biosamples uh, out of blood and urine, we actually initially established a set of tissue-based candidate predictors for progression of kidney disease, which are the patients you want to enroll into your clinical trial, and then ask, can we validate the intrarenal events in non-invasive biofluids, primarily in urine, of these elements and see if a protein encoded by a transcript associated with outcome is uh, also found in the urine and is tracking with the same predictor algorithms. This is an effort right now, which is starting to be tested in a, a larger cohort of uh, 2,500 patients from the chronic renal insufficiency cohort to see which of these volume markers actually are validating out for target selection uh, and uh, patient stratification in chronic clinical trials. The second example I would like to give is the challenge which I think uh, probably most of you in the room at one stage have been exposed to, at least in discussions describing what you are trying to do for a living, is that with the recent advent of the genetic revolution, the expectations were quite high that genetic analysis would reveal significant insight in disease pathophysiology. And we are clearly seeing traction in that area. However, one element is that the genome-wide association studies usually project a phenotype onto various genetic variances in large-scale population and determine if there's a statistical significant association detectable. The challenge, however, is if we project a polymorphism on a phenotype, then the key question, what is the biology in between, remains unanswered. And that really has plagued the Chivas field for quite a while. Guilt by proximity is a standard approach to infer causality, which I think clearly has led to significant insights. However, there's an opportunity to rethink that approach uh, in the concept of uh, the systems genetic strategy, which probably many of you are involved with, where we actually do not take a single variant and a single phenotype, but rather we try to capture the entirety of the genetic landscape 
of the regulatory machinery impacted by the variances at various stages of the regulation down to endophenotypic measures closer to the mechanistic uh, events, and then finally the phenotypic strategy. And this is a, an approach which we tested together with the CKD Gen Consortium and NIH and EU funded consortium actually performing a large meta analysis of 20 GVAS populations primarily out of cardiovascular GVAS analysis in uh, US and Europe. These are Caucasians. Initial training data set of 67,000 individuals, replication in 23,000, asking the simple question which polymorphisms are associated with impairment of renal function. And the study was uh, successful in identifying 16 polymorphisms with significant associations with renal function. A few of them were known to be related to renal function and even renal disease, a majority were not. And uh, together with the CKD Gen Consortium, Sebastian Martini in the group, who is in the room today, actually performed a sequential analysis by linking the polymorphism via regulatory network to the disease phenotype. Initially, uh, following the EQTL concept, associating the polymorphisms and transcript to the same trait, loss of kidney function, then integrating the transcripts and associated co-regulated transcript on a pathway level into prior knowledge, and finally generating out of these aggregated pathways an overall regulatory network uh, triggered by both uh, genetic and transcriptional uh, evidence. So the approaches that we took from the GVAS population, the polymorphisms, they were mapped against the trait loss of kidney function and uh, identified. Then we took from the clinical biopsy population the same strategy, but this time actually deploying uh, gene expression data sets against the loss of kidney function over time to define uh, then the interdependencies between those two approaches. We used 160 patients, same ethnicity, similar disease range, broad range of loss of kidney function. Uh, we could actually associate by uh, the proximity concept 29 uh, genes in the proximity of the 16 SNPs to be interrogated via correlation of gene expression against GFR. And here you can see uh, the summary of these results depicted for the glomerular filter compartment, which we micro dissect out and profile separately from the remainder of the kidney for the 29 CKD gen associated transcripts, color coding, positive correlation in red, green, negative correlation with uh, renal function. You can see particularly in the tubular interstitial compartment that a significant segment, 17 of the 29, actually showed uh, association with the same clinical trait as in the GIVA study. Uh, and particularly uh, down here, you have several molecules with very strong positive correlation with uh, GFR, meaning these genes are lost if you lose your kidney function. And uh, with this starting point, we now can ask, what is the biology behind that? There were a few of these genes known like VGF, where we and others have published significant evidence of relevance of these genes already for the disease processes. Many, however, were not prior uh, integrated into functional concepts around kidney disease. And to move forward on this front, Sebastian deployed a strategy that he started out with the CKD candidate genes, identify those who are associated with the same trait, GFR, then identify transcripts who are co-regulated with those tagged uh, genes, and ask these co-regulated gene sets in which molecular pathways are they found to be enriched in as a first step of uh, network-based knowledge integration. And one of the top pathways coming out of that study, actually triggered again by the VGF evidence depicted in here, is the hypoxia signaling pathways, where you can see that the majority of these transcripts are actually associated with loss of kidney function, which is in concordance with evidence from us and many other teams published over the last uh, 10 years, that this is a significant pathway of progressive uh, loss of organ function in the kidney. And one can vividly imagine that alterations of VGF as a key executor of the signaling pathway could clearly impact disease progression uh, in chronic kidney disease in general. However, we can take that concept one step further, that you not only interrogate each pathway in isolation, which obviously is an artificial construct 
establishing linearity of a signaling mechanism in a diseased organ, but rather try to integrate the pathways together by linking them with the uh, co-regulated transcript sets who are shared between different pathways so that we can generate a pathway map of chronic kidney disease, which is depicted up here, where you can see here as denotes the various uh, pathways which were tagged by evidence coming from transcriptional or genetic evidence and then linked via the uh, co-regulated transcript sets between the various pathways, spring embedded algorithm groups them together according to similarity of the uh, alter genes. And this is uh, intriguing for many purposes. We do see clearly two main areas and they are connecting elements in the center, many of which are actually well uh, established therapeutic targets, some of them even in phase three clinical trials. And if you look at the underlying concepts between each of these major nodes, we can summarize them that the uh, left aggregate is reflecting changes in the metabolomic state of the kidney. Again, many of these molecules are bona fide therapeutic targets. Some of them are already in therapeutic evaluations. And on the other side, we see significant inflammation stress responses seen across all of these chronic diseases associated with loss of kidney function. And if we look into what's seen in each specific disease, uh, taking advantage of the fact that we obviously capture a wide variety of underlying disease mechanisms. For example, we can show that in lupus nephritis, we have both uh, metabolic signatures and then inflammatory signatures, not surprising in this autoimmune disease. But again, in diabetic nephropathy, uh, disease initially considered to be primarily driven by metabolic changes, you can see uh, that in the progressive state of the disease, we have as an aggressive inflammatory signature detectable as uh, with the autoimmune disease. But this was a strategy where at least we had the first step to associate two genetic variants of some underlying biological concepts. There are many drawbacks with that study. We are currently uh, undertaking a very comprehensive EQTL approach capturing the polymorphism structure with whole genome sequences in our both diabetic nephropathy and uh, rare glomerular disease uh, cohort studies and mapping them to the RNA-seq data obtained from the corresponding tissue in the diabetic population, even in a time sequence of uh, eight years uh, as the disease progresses to uh, resolve at higher granularity the uh, observation in this context. The last example I would like to give is a study uh, where we took advantage of the fact that we do see a high degree of cell type specificity of transcripts in uh, our uh, renal compartments, particularly in the glomerular filter. And this is an observation in many other end organs shared. And many of these cell type specific events are actually also associated with rare diseases driven by uh, functional alterations of these genes and also enriched in some of the uh, progression states uh, for more common diseases manifesting in the uh, respective end organ. And in this approach, again, we had to integrate from functional genetic data, genomics data, so the clinical information, and now also mm -hmm. developmental data to see where the de development of these differential organ function is manifesting. So the concept is, but if you can predict cell lineage and functional context of for a specific transcript, then we will find these genes to be enriched in hereditary diseases. This was based on evidence for many hereditary diseases, but also with a study together with Friedhelm Hildebrand here in Michigan, where uh, cell lineage specificity allowed him to disambiguate actually exome sequencing studies, where in a small nuclear family he had several candidate genes and filtering them out for cell type specificity uh, according to the uh, cell lineages uh, driving glomerular filtration barrier failure allowed him to uh, hone in on the candidate gene on the first shot. It obviously is also an opportunity to identify markers of the disease who obviously will be less confounded by uh, non-renal uh, uh, disease mechanisms and finally, if we can identify the cell, cell type specific molecules as potential molecular therapeutic targets critical for disease manifestation in the kidney, then the expectation would be that we might see increased efficacy 
but certainly lower of Tiger's effect if a protein is restricted ex expression to a defined eigenfunction. We were fortunate to work with Olga Dryanskoyeva from Princeton, who had developed a sophisticated uh, prediction tool and uh, tested that in C. elegans uh, in her initial study, and then deployed now uh, the, in the mammalian study our uh, large-scale human data sets where we established a gold standard for tissue-specific gene expression here for the filter cells in the glomerulus depicted in green, transcript known to be cell line specific versus those neighboring cell lines with transcripts who are specific uh, for these types, but not shared with the gold standard. And then interrogated our large gene expression compendium, both in-house data sets and geo data sets with an SVM mechanisms to identify in silico uh, patterns who are predicted to be shared between the two transcripts. And then we used validation strategy with public resources to see which of these transcripts indeed were behaving as predicted, and finally tested their clinical relevance in uh, our available cohorts. So this nanodissection tool indeed was able, at least in silico, to predict significant cell type enrichment. Here you can see the density graph for the percentile predicted genes with the clear peak of the protocytes, the filter cell of the kidneys as predicted here. We then went to validate the top 132 predicted candidate molecules using the human protein atlas, uh, where a large uh, assembly of human genes, uh, with a large array of human tissues have been stained and is available for interrogation and compared it to an experimental data set where mouse, where uh, protocytes were uh, flagged by uh, GFP, fuck sorted and underwent uh, gene expression profiling in a cell type specific manner. And using this approach, we could identify an HPA from the gold standard genes that they behave indeed as predicted. Here you can see the filter cells of the glomerulus outlined with three molecules which we had prior knowledge of uh, being cell type specific and actually causal of hereditary glomerular filtration barrier failure in human or mice. And here you can see our top six predictors showing similar uh, tissue distribution as the gold standard concordant with the predictor algorithms working on target. And if you compare that uh, prediction here depicted in the open areas from the nanodissection protocol to a random gene set, but also to the uh, sorted uh, protocytes from mouse studies, we can show that our algorithm certainly is performing at adequate accuracy compared to the experimental data sets and versus the random data sets. Interestingly, uh, among our top genes, uh, which were defined in our publication, uh, were published in parallel by the uh, ProtoNet group from Franz Schaefer out of Heidelberg, MY1E, uh, to be a causal gene for FSGS, so glomerular filtration barrier failure, inherited disease. And looking at the tissue distribution of this molecule, it was behaving as predicted by our in silico approach also in the tissue uh, uh, setting not only in the disease causing elements, thereby establishing the fact that indeed this approach sometimes can work to help to identify uh, causal uh, variances out of uh, small nuclear families with exon sequencing. For acquired diseases here, you can see the density distribution in correlation with square root of GFR, meaning renal function, where uh, the predicted gene set shows a significant enrichment uh, in a correlation with loss of kidney function in these diseases over time, indicating that these uh, molecules are also regulated as the disease is progressing in a cell type specific manner. Now with these three approaches, I try to summarize strategies where in collaboration with domain experts from various areas in the community, we were able to identify disease drivers therapeutic targets and diag diagnostic markers. Uh, but the challenge really is how to do that outreach and how to uh, facilitate the clinical implementation of these large scale data sets. And uh, here, as I showed earlier, uh, we gained expertise already in Munich, Germany, but then particularly here in Michigan with the NCIBI in developing tools, approaches, and most critically, a dedicated team able to 
serve that communication functions between different domain experts. And we have three approaches currently active. One is a bilateral collaborative approach, which is kind of the standard model deployed widely in the field. We are using the NCIBI portal uh, as a communication tool for that. This is a very effective mechanism. Most of the studies presented uh, today were driven by this bilateral research strategy, but it clearly doesn't scale. The second step, which uh, Felix Eiching and Barbara Merrell developed in the framework of NCIBI is to develop semi-standardized workflows, which can be quickly implemented against recurrent question. And that clearly facilitated and sped up some of our processes, but still is limited by the one-on-one -on -one interaction demand in this concept. And the final strategy uh, to get away from the need for direct interaction was to develop a web-based search engine called Nephromind in our kidneys, this C-specific concept with Compendia Bioscience, the spin-off of the University of Michigan uh, bioinformatic program, and uh, who has developed the uh, Oncomind system for oncology initially, and we transfer that concept for renal diseases where uh, we have uh, carefully curated renal gene expression data sets mapped against uh, gene annotation data warehouse with various uh, systems biology tools, front end for an interrogation on a gene specific means to ask which transcripts are associated with which disease, disease type, and underlying biological function, which is serving the community well in this limited context but again, doesn't scale and doesn't allow individualized interrogation of data sets. And this is where uh, Brian Gill and our team had had uh, discussions over the last several years, you know, what uh, platform requirement would be to really allow the empowerment of participatory research, because that's what we really have to do with molecular medicine. That is large scale data sets, each of us only mines a minute fractions of those. So if we have an opportunity to make these data sets accessible to the domain expert who's limited to no bioinformatic background, then we really can get significant traction in identifying uh, cross-cutting biological concepts, which can be really paradigm changing. And here, you know, yes, we looked at Transmart a couple of times over the last two years and decided uh, 12 months ago to implement the Transmart platform against uh, one of our uh, rare disease research network, the Neptune network, with Transmart being the open source and open data biomedical research community for sharing, integration, standardization, and analysis of heterogeneous data from collaborative translational studies. When we mentioned that at our first steering committee, a meeting, we got blank stares from our uh, renal researchers, so Colleen kinkade Beal, uh, the project manager, came up with, yes, but what is actually Transmart, really? So we explained it that we con one can consider that as a library with the instant of Transmart, which is installed in a specific context, but it's an open system where you can load not only the content according to the needs of your studies, and the expertise of your investigators, and both, I think, are critical elements. Uh, but we also can and did develop a defined ontology to organize our library in a way which suits the need of our consortium and the associated data sets best. And what our community is starting to do over the last six weeks now is that they can start to explore the data based on their individual background knowledge. And they can slice and dice our cohorts according to expertise they have gained from studying these diseases for decades to hone in on a specific subgroup of patients with specific clinical, structural, molecular, genetic characteristics, map them against the long-term outcome data in the database, and see where cross-cutting mechanisms can be identified. And this indeed is resulting in unpredicted findings, which quite often provide disruptive insights in how we can ask these diseases. And then having a live cohort uh, feeding into Transmart, we have an opportunity to test these hypotheses derived from these data via ancillary studies in the ongoing research effort. And this is the timeframe which uh, we have uh, deployed Transmart 
uh, we uh, developed over the last eight months with the team here from the foundation and the DCMB and Transmart instance based on 1.1 and have complex clinical profiles, outcome data, environmental exposure, transcriptomic profiles, uh, targeted proteomics, uh, selected genotypes, digital histopathological, histomorphometric measure, socioeconomic status, et cetera, et cetera, in the database, but also the available biosamples, so that if an investigator surfaces a certain questions to be interrogated, you can at the same time answer the questions, what sample size do I have available if I want to start to do an exosome-based phosphoproteomic study in this cohort to test if that signaling pathway really is activated or not. We are currently intensely training our user community in how to deploy the tools. And that's again a learning curve that, you know, if you give investigators a powerful car, they might drive at places you didn't expect them to drive to. And we will have to educate as we move along particularly if investigators move into knowledge domains where they don't have a strong research background to begin with. So this is a, for us a uh, you know, fascinating time period. And you can see here with the next release, we uh, plan to implement 1.2 and really fill in several of the additional elements uh, which uh, we withhold from the initial release uh, to not overlay our user community. And then we plan uh, three to four monthly updates based on the scientific needs of the community. Our user community are currently for the specific instance targeted to the rare disease clinical research network, actually 22 academic sites across North America capturing the main uh, research nodes in uh, the US. But we also open to ancillary investigators who want to leverage their data sets coming from outside of the consortium they can access Transmart in their study planning phase to again interrogate what are groups, the segments of the population, uh, which can allow them to answer their specific questions and then uh, link the uh, analysis back into the core data sets as they have generated in an ancillary study from biosamples, further knowledge or captured further information from these individuals. And one fascinating feature is that we can actually incentivize these ancillary study investigators to feed their data back to the core data set as by integrating their data with the core data so they have the experience I had several uh, weeks ago when first accessing the 1.0 release that this approach can become highly addictive because suddenly you can identify dependencies and you can let down uh, avenues in your data, which you clearly did not expect before. And that becomes, uh, for many of our investigators, really a tool to substantially expand the horizon of where their vitamin D study is taking them away from their preconceived notions in many uh, novel areas of, of research. So with this, I would like to close. So our envision is that actually Transmart indeed can empower deep multiscalar data integration in glomerular disease to define novel disease drivers, that it can bring molecular medicine to our patients by levering the shared ontologies we are fortunately in place, the clinical data capture instruments, the sample procurement and the standardized data generation, so that we can move to an integrative data mining with the global research community and looking forward to do that not only with public, but also with private partners who have such a significant commitment to Transmart as well. With this, I think the key slide is the team who has been behind that. This is a team in my group, the team around the uh, Neptune group, uh, active at uh, multiple sites. And for the Transmart uh, development specifically, Colleen Kincaid B, Felix Eichinger, Vici Naya, Sebastian Mariani, Laura Martini, Laura Mariani, and Barbara Miral. Several of them are at the table at the end of the room to your, to your left if you have any questions. And obviously Kevin Smith, Terry Tsark, Marcy and Vasu here from the foundation have been instrumental in getting uh, us started. And Gil and Brian for their vision and long-term support. Thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, I hope there's some questions or comments.
How many of you have drugs for kidney diseases? <laughs> oh. Well, I don't have drugs for kidney disease, but this is really outstanding work. This is really the direction that we all in this room would, li would like to take because it's definitely the way to, to approach this, uh, this problem. And looking at all the different, your research for the, uh, so many years in system biology with all the different papers you published and knowing your knowledge you have today of Transmart with the Neptune project, which of your papers that you did previously could have, where, for which of your papers would Transmart ha could have helped you? Mm -hmm. Which, because we can't do everything with Transmart, but we would, I would love to read again some of your papers, knowing with your expertise, which of your previous studies, on looking at all your science and all your, the, the, all your publications, where Transmart could, help, could have helped you? You know, it's a fascinating aspect actually for most of them, because we find that Transmart is, you know, your empty library where you can actually build a significant part of the research effort according to your specific questions and also very importantly, according to the expertise of your user community. And so think with the gene expression, GVAS integration, clearly that is possible in Transmart and uh, with the integration of clinical phenotype with proteomic data set and outcome that clearly is possible in Transmart and it does so much more. It really depends what you feed in and what I found most fascinating is the opportunity uh, to actually subset your patient population based on specific criteria and then do very quickly your descriptive character, uh, characteristics and the associated molecular signatures. Because this is an aspect where our process right now in all of these consortium is that if an investigator has an idea, he formulates that idea, he transmits it to a central data coordinating center where the expert biostatistician is asking if that idea is feasible and feeds back. And then the answer usually is no, you don't have the sample size or no, you're too selective here or there is, you know, in your underlying assumption, a significant uh, flaw. So this is a very painful iterative process. It slows down progress tremendously. And Transmart is disruptive here in the sense that it empowers the user community to really refine these hypotheses, these concepts early on, so that when they come to us now, we come up with a very refined question. And yes, we still have to do the proper biostatistics centrally, and yes, you no, know, Transmart is naive with the underlying statistical assumptions. So there is a need for a cross validation. But we see that the user community comes with a lot more informed questions. They come in with very novel, really disruptive insights. And our rare disease network, if you set, for example, the socioeconomic strata according to income, you can show that if you present with a disease, there's no difference according to uh, uh, income or socioeconomic status or educational level. If you look 18 months later, those with adequate resources have significantly uh, altered their disease towards remission of the disease. Those without resources have not done so. And now we can even look into what are the underlying molecular concepts behind that env environmental exposure. And you can spin that the other way around. We have genetic risk factors, APOL1, for these type of diseases was a primarily driver of minority disease. And we can ask which environmental factors appear to be interacting with APOL1. And that can be done not by a laborious back and forth process with a central system, but rather by the investigators on the fly. The APOL1 may be unfamiliar to many people. It's an yeah. important new discovery. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, um, I have a question in terms of the data that's in the Neptune right now. Um, so since the data is in the in a Transmars um, um, instance, I was wondering uh, for accessing the data, is there any way that actually um, Neptune offers a uh, bulk sort of a Transmars ready um, file that you can actually have an internal instance? Or because I think we actually have um, some level of access to the system, but um, it's still through, um, 
it's not the sort of the complete and access is rather a um, um, I don't know, personal or some kind of a uh, through an interface. So we cannot really do the, the type of analysis you describe in your early use cases mm -hmm. in, like, internally. I think you know, the question is, you know, this is a live study. So we are generating these data as we speak. It's a federal funded study and we are committed to releasing these data to the uh, research community mm -hmm. at large. After an initial phase where the uh, research network is interrogating the data, but even at that stage, we are open via the ancillary study approach that whatever investigator wants to learn inside Transmart, what are the first dependencies detected in there so that they can generate a hypothesis then to come back to the full study. We have other data sets in studies who are significantly more mature and longer available which we would love to load into Transmart, for example, the ESCB data set and the C-probe data set. Those are studies who have been quite mature, and we would love to have them uh, widely available to the research community. Uh, so basically, the data set, the study that's actually passed the data embargo period, um, basically, whoever wants to get access to, so there is a mechanism that actually get the... Yes, the, yes. and okay. we have actually, this is, with uh, you know, most of these large-scale research network, mm -hmm. you, know, you have a sequential stage where uh, the networks are generating these data sets. Mm -hmm. The yes. data sets are interrogated. And certainly with the Neptune study, we are very keen to recruit investigators to the data set mm -hmm. and to provide them access via Transmart for an initial data exploration using an auxiliary study mechanisms which have been developed together with the uh, NIH to ensure mm -hmm. adequate access, but also adequate protection of the research subjects. Uh, yes, actually, I was the reason I asked this is actually uh, I was thinking that uh, right now, sort of the researchers' access to to the data is through the Transmart interface. Um, I, I feel like Transmart actually can be a really good platform to deliver this type of more of a curated. Um, these public effort uh, studies, because studies like, say, um, TCGA and others, you know, they've been, they are all coming from this kind of consortium effort, but, the, and the data is released and it's downloadable to, to, the, to the general public. But the issue is the data is really not, you know, properly curated, not mapped in using the same ontology. Absolutely, no, this is exactly, this was actually the main rationale behind the nephromine web-based search engine we developed eight years ago. That yes, we deposit our data in GEO mm -hmm. or in dbGaP. Yes. And I always say they rot in the drawer there in the sense that the utility is very, very limited. Exactly. And very limited to a small group of expert users who know how to download and annotate their data set. And uh, Nephromine and I think Transmart to a significantly larger extent will be tools who actually empowers the research community without that expertise knowledge to actually interrogate the data set. And what I love about 1.2, and I haven't evaluated myself yet, is that with the meta-analysis function, if you have an underlying same ontology and procurement of data and sample, which we actually have in our disease areas across the multiple research networks we have in place, then you actually can have these data sets emerging in Transmart. And each of these research network has their own governance body and has their own philosophy when and how to release data. Mm -hmm. yes. But as the data releases are progressing, then you can naturally converge the ontologies and can come up with very exciting cross-cutting analysis. And you know, this is one effort we are currently doing already with our colleagues at first PKU. Uh, where we have a joint institute and are mapping, for example, biomarkers, which we found initially in the transcriptome in the European population, validated in North America and now cross-validating in a cohort uh, in Beijing. So these opportunities, I think, are an aspect where if you push forward to user-based access uh, criteria in a stratified manner, could become very helpful. Yeah, I, I, my name is Kees van Bokhoven. I have a, a follow-up question on also the remark that you made earlier and, um, to Paul's question. There's two types of users in Transmart. Sort of, there's a dual user community, you could say. On the one hand, you have the clinicians or molecular biologists 
who can use the uh, user interface to their advantage to explore the data, as you uh, also mentioned. On the other hand, we also have the expert bioinformaticians and um, um, statisticians that could use Transmart potentially as a data repository. And um, in the last 1.2 release, we have tried to do some major effort to make things easier for those user groups, such as the RESTful API and R API, etc. So my question is, um, if you look to your user community, for example, in Neptune, how is the balance um, between those two types of users? Is it one or the other? Or? Yeah, I think this is an, an, an aspect where currently we are heavily, let me uh, move to my to Colleen, who is actually involved in some of these efforts in trying to stratify. So I think one of the challenges is that uh, we initially designed Transmart with a very narrow, relatively narrow focus towards you know, the clinician scientist with a good basic biology, genetic, molecular understanding, but with no deep bioinformatic expertise. And you know, it's six weeks out, but certainly the feedback we got was overwhelmingly positive. The user community feels empowered. They don't feel like you know, they procure, they generate samples and data. They disappear in the black hole of the data coordinating center and are never seen again. But rather, they can see now in close to real life, in two, three months interval, how the data sets are maturing, and they can connect their background knowledge to that. And I think that was the main goal why we focused on that. The so next step, obviously, is you know what is the expert group here? And this is you know, many of the people you know, which you saw the data from uh, are available here. You know what do they want to get out of? And Colleen is kind of brainstorming along those next steps. Right. So part of what we're doing, uh, like Matthias said, is we had the first primary group, uh, our primary use case, which was these clinician scientists and how to use that, and we've released that. Um, and now we have two more use cases that we're working on. One is the internal, um, the ASBC, the Applied System Biology Core that Matthias mentioned. And so how can this group of folks use that? Uh, so there's where we really get into more of the expert users and we get into many data sets from different sources and, and looking into that. Uh, and then a third um, use case that we're also working on is looking at a very collaborative uh, analysis with folks outside of the university and doing really deep bioinformatic collaboration. And so we're looking at Transmart and seeing how with 1.2, some of that'll be easier. And then what are some of the links that, because we're actually working with the Michigan Transmart team. So how can we pull in some links to things that aren't there right now, but that we want to be? So so we're, we're still working on it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julie Bryant. Um, we, we're going to be talking later on about an omic soft integration, so that may help you as well because um, that's really good for the um, high deep level bioinformatics analysis, so it can take the information out of Transmart into omic soft and then you can start working on the, um, on the analysis workflow. Yeah, I think this is one, and we were very fortunate with the NCIBI that you know, we had a systematic analysis of workflows and how the bioinformatician together with domain expert actually executed some of the projects you saw today. And Barbara Merrell in her analysis clearly identified that there are several steps where you, know, you reach a certain conclusion, you define that data set as a starting point for your next sequence of analysis. And this functionality, for example, would be one critical one to see reflected in Transmart so that if you have workflows, the output of a workflow then can be set as a starting point as a meta data set for the next flow of, of, of analyses. And certainly in 1.1, that functionality is not required, not available and not required for what we use it right now. But if you get more into the power users, as we would refer to them, then this would become a critical element. And also tracking propensity, tracking workflow and others. Uh, okay, I think, thank uh, Matthias and colleagues. Thank you.